Hi, I'm Efnan Han, and this is Across the Balkans. This week on the show, we look into Montenegro's political upheaval. The government has fallen once again in just four months after Parliament passed a no-confidence vote. It follows a controversial deal with the Serbian Orthodox Church, which Prime Minister Drita Nabazovic signed in early August. The deal regulates relations between the church, including its real estate ownership rights, and the state of Montenegro. Although Montenegro declared its independence from Serbia in 2006, its church did not gain autonomy. The deal sparked protests and was criticized by pro-Western parties for giving the church too much power compared to other religious communities. President Milo Djukanovic's party then called for an urgent parliamentary vote of no confidence, which led to the collapse of Abazovic's coalition government. And what now lies ahead for the country isn't yet clear. Mirjana Mladinovic has more from Podgorica. Objavljujem da je 43. vlada Crne Gore izgubila povjerenje. Montenegrin lawmakers toppled Prime Minister Darita Nabazovic government just weeks after he signed a deal regulating the position of the country's Serbian Orthodox Church. It now paves the way for yet another political crisis. The no-confidence motion passed shortly after Friday midnight with 50 votes to one, while the rest of the 81-seat parliament boycotted the measure. It was the Democratic Party of Socialists and its partners who initiated the vote, despite initially giving Drita Nabazovic a mandate to form a government. But during the plenary session, they said the church deal wasn't the main reason why they called for the motion and that it had more to do with the government failing to unblock negotiations with the EU. Umjesto da se iskoristi podrška u parlamentu, umjesto da se deblokiraju institucije, umjesto podrške koja je data bez ikakvog ucijenjivanja i uslovljavanja, umjesto da sa našim evropskim i međunarodnim partnerima učinimo državu Crnu Goru sposobnom i spremnom da do 2025. godine postane članica Evropske unije, ta šansa nažalost nije iskorištena. Nije iskorištena zbog toga što očigledno postojale su neke druge teme i neke druge obaveze. But Abazovic cites the deal as the main reason why his government is no more. Vi niste odma da kažem inicijativu podnijeli zbog toga, nego ste inicijativu podnijeli zato što se potpisao temeljni ugovor kojeg niste smjeli sada da pomenete imenom. Da ste podnijeli inicijativu nakon što nismo uspjeli da izglasamo Sudski savjet, iako to nije obaveza vlade nego ovog parlamenta, mi bi se pridružili u toj inicijativi, pošli bi na izbore, tačno. Vi to niste uradili, vi ste prijetili da ćete, ako se potpiše temeljni ugovor, srušiti vladu. In a last dish attempt to save his government, Abazović accused the Democratic Party of Socialists and its leader Milo Đukanović who is also the president, of calling the vote to cover up their links to organized crime. U tom trenutku, kad svataju da piramida kriminala počinje da pada, treba izvući kec iz rukava. Kec iz rukava ne može da bude borba protiv organizovanog kriminala i korupcije, jer to ne podržavaju naši međunarodni partneri, naročito ne Amerikanci, nego treba izvući temeljni ugovor. I pomamit narod. I počinje organizowana akcja destabilizacji države. Those accusations gave Abazovic a few hours to try to form some new majority and come up with a plan to reshuffle the government. Nema rekonstrukcije, mehanizam ide u ruke Mila Đukanovića. A kakva je situacija u Crnoj Gori? Mehanizam neće poći u ruke Mila Đukanovića, mehanizam će poći u ruke Bemaksa. I on će odlučiti Ko može da napravi vladu, ko ne može da napravi vladu. But it was already too late. It's unclear what will happen and what the options are. Early elections, the problem is who will organize them, who will form a new government and how will this time be different. Because it looks like all possible coalitions have already been tried and tested. And analysts say only one option remains. Tehnička prelazna vlada, jedna vrsta koncentracione široke vlade koja bi zasigurno u sebi imala više od dvije trećine 
političkih subjekata i stranaka koje konstituišu trenutni parlament i ona kao takva bi omogućila da se relativno brzo izaberu sudi Ustavnog suda i nesmetano omogući održavanje izbornih procesa na svim nivojima i ona kao tehnička i prelazna ne bi ni jednom od političkih subjekata dala jednu vrstu startne prednosti u izbornom procesu. The political scene here has been intense for more reasons than one. The Balkans have been a field of collision for two political groups, pro-EU and NATO on one side and pro-Serbian and Russian on the other. Sada su očekivanja da li će se konstituisati pro-evropska većina koja će konstituisati tehničku prelaznu vladu koja bi što prije obezbijedila sprovođenje izbora ili će se nastaviti jedna vrsta agonije pod vrlo snažnim uticajem dijela regionalnih igrača kojima odgovara kriza u Bosni, kriza na Kosovu, potencijalna kriza u Crnoj Gori i samim tim u okviru geopolitičkog procesa u Ukrajini stvaranje krize na granicama EU. The Serbian Orthodox Church and the Beto deal lies right in the middle of this debate. Neobičajne situacije da tri vlade za redom padaju u slovno račano na crkvenom pitanju. Dakle, ovdje je pitanje odbrana sekularnog karaktera države Crne Gore, ovdje je pitanje odbrana evropskih i civilizacijskih vrijednosti i ovdje je odbrana od snažnog stranog uticaja, a ja bih dakle sve pozvao na izvještaj Evropskog parlamenta koji je ukazao da je Srpska pravoslavna crkva u izvisnom smislu jedna vrsta instalacije koja sprovodi određene proruske politike na prostorima Balkana i kao takva relativno, da kažem i opasna, sa stanovišta budućnosti ukupnog procesa na prostoru koju definišemo kao Zapadni Balkan. Much of the public had hoped that the Abazović government would leave all this controversy behind. Postojalo je dakle u dilu javnosti očekivanje da će ta vlada krenuti sa evropskim integracijama, da će ta vlada raditi za građanina. Međutim, mi vidjeli se što se desilo. Znači, u agendi prioriteta rada te vlade nije bilo to što se očekivalo, to što su oni obećavali, zašto su konačno mi dobili podršku od strane Demokratske partije socijalista, već se upravo desilo suprotno. The US and EU have called on Montenegro to either form a new government or hold elections to resolve the crisis without losing any more time. But with each passing day, Montenegro seems to be losing a lot more. Mirjana Miladinović, TRT World, Podgorica, Montenegro. My guest today is Lubomir Filipović from Podgorica. He is a political analyst and the former deputy and acting mayor of the Montenegrin town of Budva. Thank you so much for being with us today on the program, sir. Now, there seems to be a pattern of no confidence in parliament, which is further pushing the country into a political crisis. And that deal that uh, Abazovic made with the Serbian Orthodox Church seems to be the last straw that led to the vote, but it wasn't the determining factor that pushed the Green Party out of uh, out of power, wasn't it? Basically, it's false. It was. It was the the uh, determining factor that uh, pushed away uh, the Democratic Party of Socialists just for providing uh, the minority support for the Abbasid government and all the Socialist Democratic Party who were participating in the government with uh, with two ministers, Minister of Defense and Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, this coalition had its problems, but for all of the participants of this uh, unwilling coalition, uh, were trying to keep the things together. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, unfortunately, Mr. Abazovic decided to, uh, uh, to to put as 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 a foremost priority mm -hmm. uh, the issue with the, with the Serbian Orthodox Church, the agreement, and doing so, he endangered the European path and with some other things like the issue with the constitution, constitutional court right. and the reforms that were needed okay. in the judiciary sector. Uh, that was, this was the tipping point, mm -hmm. uh, the agreement with the Serbian Church. All right, so let's talk, let's talk a bit about this, this agreement. So Abazovic made a deal with the Serbian Orthodox Church, and it aims to regulate relations between the Serbian Orthodox Church and the state of Montenegro. Why was this deal so controversial, especially given the fact that nearly half of the population adheres to the church? Uh, the problem with... Uh, with, with the text of the agreement was in, in, mostly in the preamble, which was which was 
the sound, the, the, the language of it was, was very ideological in the sense that it was negating, it was uh, putting the Serbian church in a very dominant position in, in Montenegro, putting it above the law to be, to be, to be, uh, to be precise. Uh, this narrative, which we are listening from the Serbian church in Montenegro for years already, for decades, if not for decades, is, is negating the right. It's it, it actually uh, not allowing Montenegro to, to build its own identity because uh, the mission of the Serbian church in Montenegro actually is, 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 is of, for enhancing the Serbian identity in Montenegro, which is very fluid and which has been a... Uh, and, and a topic for many for many scholars debating about the this right. uh, uh, cleavage between the Serbian and, and Montenegrin identity that been uh, that been burdening Montenegrin mm -hmm. politics for decades now. Right, and that's what President Milano Đukanović had wanted. He wanted to form an independent Orthodox Church, minimizing the power that the Serbian Orthodox Church has. Moving forward, do you think that we can see that happen? And if it does happen, what would the repercussions of that be? Could we? see civil unrest in the country? We've seen similar things happening in the, in the past in, in countries that have Orthodox Christian majority. That's the issue with these countries, such as exactly you have the example in Ukraine. So the problem with the Montenegro is that we're not getting the support from the, for the uh, autocephaly of the Montenegrin Orthodox Church from the main guy, from which is uh, based in, in Istanbul, from the uh, ecumenical patriarch in, 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 in Istanbul. Uh, because Montenegro is, is very small, we have uh, 600,000 uh, population citizens, out of that 75% are Orthodox Christians. And in that sense, we are not so important like Ukraine as Ukraine is. And then there's, there's the issue that you mentioned already that we don't have enough support among the Montenegrin Orthodox Christian population for mm -hmm. the uh, for the independence for the Montenegrin Church, mm -hmm. as, as, as it was not the issue, for example, with the Macedonian Orthodox Church that recently gained autocephaly. So there right. are many complicated issue, mm -hmm. with, with issues with, with, with the, the Serbian Church in Montenegro. Unfortunately, they have the dominant position. They are owners of the whole church infrastructure in the country when it comes to the Orthodox Christianity. Right. Montenegrin Orthodox Church do exist, but it's a small religious community which has no churches, has no temples, has no infrastructure, and what is very important, they have no okay. financial support. Right, and moving forward, uh, Abazovic, during a session at Parliament, was also criticized for not focusing enough on the country's accession into the EU. And the renewed political deadlock in the country is a major setback for Montenegro, isn't it? Of course it is, because uh, as as from Friday, we don't see the solution. So there, there are several scenarios. Uh, where, where, where will this uh, crisis end? So we will we'll either have a return to the old uh, parliamentary majority from 2020, which is which is very dangerous to, to, to put it bluntly. Because we have a majority that is not pro-European, that is more pro-Russian and pro-Serbian. The other scenario is to have a political government formed between. Uh, between uh, the pro-European parties and, and one pro serbian party, which is also highly, highly unlikely. And there, there is this new idea of forming a technocratic government formed from experts which are not members of the political party that are coming from the civil society sector. It will be a pro-temporary government which will organize the fair elections in, in, uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in a couple of months, in time of time of a couple of months. So do you think that as long as Montenegro stays under Serbia's influence, it'll be harder for the country to pull itself out of this political crisis because there does need to be a fine balance between its autonomous status and its ties to Serbia? We have a, we have a huge problem uh, with, with Serbian politics right now, not just in Montenegro, but with Bosnia and Kosovo. We, we will be facing this in Kosovo in, in, a, in, in a week or so. So Serbia is acting as a, as, a, as a proxy. Serbian government is acting as a proxy for mm -hmm. Russian interest in the Balkans. And Russian interest in the Balkans uh, for now is creating tensions, damaging social cohesion in the, in, in the Balkan societies, in the Western Balkan societies. So as long as Serbia is not, is not uh, dedicated to uh, regional stability and security in a, in a constructive way, 
we could expect Montenegro to be under constant threat coming from, from Serbia and from Russia. All right, Lubomir Filipovic, he is a political analyst and the former deputy and acting mayor of the Montenegrin town of Budva. Thank you so much for joining us here on Across the Balkans. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Let's cross now to the latest high-level crisis talks between the leaders of Kosovo and Serbia. The EU-mediated talks were held last week in Brussels with an appeal to both sides to be flexible and find common ground. Those are also the conditions set by the EU for both countries to join the bloc. But while the meeting ended without a compromise on a long-standing border dispute and mutual recognition issues, the leaders have agreed to continue the talks. Kosovo, formerly a province of Serbia, declared independence in 2008. Belgrade has refused to recognize the move. The two countries have been engaging in dialogue for more than a decade to normalize relations. But tensions escalated late last month when Pristina said Serbian IDs and license plates would no longer be valid on Kosovo territory. Serbs in northern Kosovo responded with protests blocking roads. Kosovo's Prime Minister Albin Kurti delayed implementing the rule for a month following pressure from his Western partners. After the meeting, NATO's Kosovo force announced it has increased its presence in the country's north to address the security challenges. To get more on this, I am joined now by Afrim Hoti. He's a professor of international law at the University of Pristina. Thank you, Professor, for being with us on the program today. Now, we're constantly witnessing the two sides sit for talks that end with no sort of consensus. Why has it been so difficult for Kosovo and Serbia to come to an agreement? Uh, having to the consideration the circumstances between two countries seems that uh, kind of consensus is impossible or seem to be impossible without uh, having uh, a mutual recognition between uh, two countries uh, because um, whatever or whatever attempt is taken so far uh, was not taken into consider consideration seriously or was seen uh, totally different from diff from uh, the respective sides while serbia is uh, perceiving the dialogue as uh, as a dialogue between belgrade and pristina considering uh, kosovo as part of uh, its uh, uh, sovereignty uh, Kosovo is uh, seeing a dialogue between two states, which, uh, which everything uh, starts uh, from uh, the recognition. Based on this uh, fact, Pristina just introduced now the, the, the well-known principle of international law, uh, principle of reciprocity, uh, something which is uh, not recognized by Serbia and uh, is uh, serving kind of obstacle uh, to go uh, to the end or to, to go to the compromise between two parts. All right, I'm going to come back to that uh, in a bit, but the EU has had little effect in mediating tensions between the two sides, and the political fallout between Serbia and Kosovo is delaying their goal of joining the bloc, isn't it? Yes, it is. In fact, there will be no EU uh, for, for neither of the, of the part, neither for Serbia nor for Kosovo without uh, having the compromise. Uh, but uh, since we are talking for the EU, then I have to emphasize that EU at least is uh, not proving to be uh, capable to mediate uh, between two sides because uh, the EU itself has no position toward, toward the conflict. Uh, as we know, there are some EU members which still do not recognize Kosovo, and the policy of EU towards the conflict is interpreted with ambiguity. So some countries are recognizing and saying that, well, there is, this is a dialogue between two countries. Some are still avoiding even to, to use uh, the terms which are referring to the state. And this, uh, in fact, makes EU uh, not capable and not, uh, not um, enough strong to mediate and to achieve final the agreement. Right. So Kosovo has been subject to following the rules and regulations regarding the documentation Kosovars needed upon entry to Serbia. And Kurti is now saying that these new rules that he's put are countermeasures that merely makes Kosovar and Serbian citizens equals. But why do you think it took Kurti so long to make this move when Serbia has been asking for this documentation from Kosovar since 2011? Yeah, I think there is more more than a decade that uh, Serbia is introducing this, is, is forcing somehow this kind of policy toward the Kosovo citizens, while uh, Kosovars uh, so far uh, expected or were hopefully looking toward the, an agreement which finally 
uh, would conclude with a, with a mutual recognition and, uh, and avoid use of any documents between the citizens of, of two countries. Since there was no uh, uh, result in this award, since uh, Serbia uh, continued his, uh, its campaign and its policy toward the Kosovo citizens, into the political scheme of Kosovo uh, came the idea that we have to uh, implement now, because this is not the, the only moment we speak for the reciprocity, even the previous government spoke of, uh, of, the, of the same measures to be taken by the Kosovo government as Serbia is doing uh, the same. And uh, finally, after we have now the new government, it seems that uh, the current prime minister wants to, to implement it, uh, not, uh, not to, um, to, 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 to impose it as a countermeasure, but just to implement the principle of reciprocity. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not the only decision taken by, by the Kosovo government. It seems that in the a, in a coming weeks and months, uh, the principle of reciprocity if there will be no uh, agreement between two countries, okay. will be implemented so in the other spheres. Right, and uh, Serbian President uh, Aleksandr Vucic called on NATO uh, to, quote, do its job in protecting ethnic Serbs in Kosovo. And that statement was followed by what has been seen as a threat by many, where Vucic says if they don't protect them, Serbia itself will move in to protect its minority. Do you see that as a threat? No, I definitely don't, because uh, because uh, no one is uh, speaking of any threat. No one is speaking of any campaign or whatsoever for Kosovo uh, minorities. Uh, all uh, the government is uh, is taking is uh, a decision to to treat equally all citizens in, in Kosovo. I do not see uh, a kind of threat, the, the declaration of, of, Mr., uh, of Mr. Vucic, while I think that NATO is, uh, is uh, doing its part in, in Kosovo because the mandate of NATO is uh, peace and security environment for all communities in, in, in Kosovo. Mm -hmm. There are also fears that the West, uh, in the West rather, that Russia could encourage Serbia into an armed intervention in northern Kosovo that would shift some sort of attention away from the war in Ukraine. Are those fears legitimate? I think there are, and this is not something new because Russia is present uh, continuously in, in the Republic of Serbia. Now we can we can see, and it is broadly uh, seen that uh, Serbia is only the only country in the in, in Southeast Europe, even in Europe which uh, did not uh, 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 put itself in the opposition to the, to the aggression of, of uh, Russia. So uh, this uh, leads us to the conclusion that the relations between Serbia and Russia are, are very close, and Russia is continuously present with its center in, close to Kosovo border in, in uh, Niš. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the open conflict and intervention to the, into the Kosovo, I do not see any any possibility because, as I said earlier, in Kosovo we have a, a NATO uh, mission right. named under the name K Force, which is uh, the only uh, authority to ensure peace and stability in the in the country. So after we uh, saw tensions between the two sides increase, particularly at the border, the Kosovo government postponed the implementation of the identity document and the car registration plate requirements until September the first. They haven't reached a compromise yet, and it doesn't seem like that'll happen within the next week or so. So can we expect to see renewed tensions at the border? In my point of view, I don't think, I don't think so. And I have two main arguments which make me convinced that um, attention will not be seen in the beginning of September. The first is uh, the previous agreement uh, between Kosovo authorities and Serbian authorities for the recognition of, of uh, documents and car plates. So uh, whatever uh, uh, Kosovo government is uh, trying to implement is uh, it was foreseen with the previous agreement with the, with uh, by the by the two countries, and the second is uh, that uh, an extra time given to the parties, especially to the Republic of Serbia. I'm I'm, I'm talking here for the month of August. It's enough uh, to convince not only the Serbs but also the Western powers that uh, that uh, there is no way back. And uh, the only way is to implement uh, the agreement. All right. Professor of International Law, Afrim Hoti, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for that analysis. Uh, thank you. A pleasure.
And we'll leave you with a positive development from the region. Bosnian swimmer Lana Pudar has clinched the biggest victory of her career, winning gold at the European Aquatic Championships in Rome. The 16-year-old was the youngest competitor in the final and made history by bringing home her country's first European Championship medal. But more interestingly, the city she comes from doesn't even have an Olympic-sized pool. And thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans with me, Afnan Han. See you next time.